Today on Know the Truth from Philip de Courcy. Here we are occupied with the task that God gives man, the significance of our lives, and it leads to much confusion and consternation. But this we do know. He has made everything beautiful in its time. The week you've just gone through, the last year you've just gone through, and you're not sure what God is up to. Where does this fit, Lord? He'll make it all beautiful in its time. Ever wonder why time seems to fly by, yet we're always reaching for something beyond our grasp? Today on Know the Truth, Philip DeCourcy dives into the mystery of time itself and explains how God, the master clockmaker, governs every moment. We're exploring life's big questions and learning how to find peace in life's uncertainties with a message titled, It's About Time, Part 3. If you missed the first two segments of this message, you'll find them online at ktt.org. But now, to get started, here is Pastor Philip DeCourcy. Well, let's take our Bibles and turn to Ecclesiastes, and we're in a multiple sermon uh, exposition of Ecclesiastes 3. Solomon has established convincingly that God is the one who winds up the clock of time. He governs its every movement. He governs its every moment. God is apart from and above time, but God is involved in time. Time is a creation. I believe what we have detailed historically and accurately for us in Genesis 1 and 2 is the unfolding of God's creative action over a six-day period where God marks out time in mornings and evenings. God created time, space, and matter. And you and I are bound by it but he is not. God created time and God keeps time. Time does not master him as it masters us. It serves him. It does his bidding. He is the one who has a purpose for everything done in time under heaven. God is the one who sends time. God is the one who appoints and apportions time. But it does raise a question. What's our part in the plan, if any? What is our role, if any, in the unfolding drama of human existence? And it's no wonder we should ask that question because according to Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 11, God has put eternity in our hearts. The one who makes everything beautiful in its time put eternity in our hearts. Now, the meaning of that phrase is this, that man innately reach for the transcendent. We have more than a sneaking suspicion that there's more than our eye can see and our hands can touch. Deep down, we know that what matters is not matter. Each and every human soul has this innate impulse to press beyond the limits of this present world and reach for the stars. Sadly, for some, that takes them to the seance, to the fortune teller. Others, it has them visiting church to hear about a life to come, a dimension to the human existence that's beyond the five senses. It's no wonder we probe into time, its start, its finish, its meaning, what lies beyond it. Solomon does it here and he acknowledges that we do it because eternity is in our heart. We're created after the image of God. We want to know what the future is. We want to know our place in an ever-expansive universe. Wanting to know what's up with life and getting to know what's up with life but are two different things. We want to know what's up with life. But Solomon reminds us, although eternity is in our heart, we cannot, look at the end of verse 11, find out the work that God does from beginning to end. Solomon acknowledges that because of our finiteness and our fallenness, we end up with a view of life that's limited, narrow, incomplete. We have a keyhole perspective on human history. No one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. The thimble of our mind 
cannot hold the ocean of God's plans and purposes. There is a God who has a season for everything and a purpose to the times that we go through. And Solomon gives us a sample and a summary of those times. And because eternity is in our heart, because we're made after the image of an eternal God, we want to get our hands around it and our heads around it, but we can't. We never will. This anticipates Paul, right? We know in part. That's why today you're holding up a piece of your life's puzzle and you're going, Lord, where in the world does this go? Surely this doesn't make sense. But there are two things in these verses we do want to grasp and we can grasp. But let me outline them. Time is governed by God. Verse 11, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Here we are occupied with the task that God gives men, according to verse 10. Here we are trying to grasp the significance of our lives, and it leads to much confusion and consternation. But this we do know, and we're told to believe this. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Time is governed by God. Secondly, time is gifted by God. Verse 12, I know that nothing is better than that men would rejoice and do good all their lives, and every man should eat, drink, and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. We'll get to this next time. Basically, the whole point of verse 12 is this. Although you cannot comprehend all that God is doing, therefore you cannot comprehend all that there is to be experienced and all that there is to be enjoyed. Don't let that stop you enjoying the moment you're in. You don't have to have all the answers to life's questions to enjoy your wife's love, your children's admiration, a good steak, a cold drink on a hot day, or a piping hot cup of coffee on a winter's morning. Nothing better than that. That's not concluding that we're kind of ants in an anthill. It's just simply saying, you know what? Even in the midst of what you don't understand, you will find that God gives you enough things to enjoy to rejoice in over his kindness. Time is governed by God. Let's spend a few minutes looking at this. While we may not know all that God is up to at a given moment, we do know that when he's finished with it, it will be fitting, beautiful, and appropriate. Remember we saw that's the meaning of that word, beautiful. It's used in Ecclesiastes 5 verse 18 where it's translated proper. It's a beautiful thought, isn't it? that whatever we're going through, good or bad, we like it or we don't like it, that it has its proper place and it has its clear purpose in the plan of God for your life and my life. He makes it all proper, appropriate, fitting. You may hold it up right now, the week you've just gone through, the month you've just gone through, the last year you've just gone through, and you're not sure what God is up to. Where does this fit, Lord? He'll make it all beautiful in its time. God's governance of history is an act of artistry. Life is not a series of hapless, disjointed events. There is a designer label sewn into the lining of this world. And in the end, God will waste nothing of our lives. Amen? He will waste nothing of our lives. That's why in time you'll see that there's a purpose to that tragedy. There's a reason to that calamity. And there is a kindness in that difficulty. That's good to know. And if you were with us in the study of the life of Joseph, you'll have seen that played out, where Joseph ends up becoming the prime minister of Egypt, saves his family, protects the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He announces that to his brothers in Genesis 45, and then later in Genesis 50, you didn't send me here, God did. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. He announces that when he's 30. His brothers come down during the famine to get some grain from Egypt, and they learn, hey, sniveling little Joseph is the prime minister of Egypt, and he holds our life in his hands. Can you believe that? They shake in their boots. They crawl before him, begging for mercy. And he says, guys, don't worry. God sent me. God's in this. Making everything beautiful in time requires timing, but God's the Lord of time. I don't know if you've ever thought about the punctuality of God. That means you'll be at church in time because God's punctual. You can arrive late to the worship of God, but God will never arrive late to the needs in your life. 
It's the kind of God you worship. It's the kind of God you serve. Some of us are not that punctual. I like the story of the husband and wife who were going at it. He shouts up the stairs, will you hurry up? If you don't get a move on, we'll be late. She shouts down, stop nagging me. I've been telling you for the past hour, I'll be down in a minute. <laughs> That's us, isn't it? But God's punctual. Write these verses down, Galatians 4.4. 4. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. The word fullness there carries the idea of that which is ripened and made ready. Romans 5 verse 6, for when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Acts 2 verses 1 through 4, the day of Pentecost, what do we read? When the day of Pentecost was fully come, the Spirit comes and they're all filled with the Holy Ghost. God wasn't late at Bethlehem. God wasn't late at Calvary. God wasn't late at Pentecost. Listen to these words by Ian McPherson in an interesting sermon entitled The Punctuality of God. It is the supreme paradox of history that the eternal God is always on time. He who stands beyond the ordered sequence of temporal events pays the strictest attention to the march of the moments and plans his interventions in terrestrial affairs or what looks to us like interventions. For God is within his world as well as above it, imminent as well as transcendent with the greatest possible care and precision. He is a punctual God. That's why He'll make it all beautiful in its time. Don't have time to turn to these, but remember when Saul was looking for those lost donkeys in 1 Samuel 9? He meets Samuel at the appointed time set by God. Remember Mary and Joseph had traveled to Bethlehem for the census at the same time she gave birth to Jesus, fulfilling Micah 5 verse 2? Remember the ram caught in the thicket at the exact moment where Abraham's going to plunge the knife into the chest of his son Isaac? Coincidence? No, providence. The punctual God who's never early, who's never late. The ancient of days is always on time. Therefore, he will make it all beautiful in its time because his timing is always perfect tell you a story. Saturday morning, many, many years ago in our home, we were putting our coats on to go out the door. The girls were small. We were going to one of our favorite towns in Northern Ireland to shop and eat lunch, port it down. We were almost out the door when the phone rang and I decided to take it. Turned out it was my mom. She says, you know what, Philip, are you okay? I said, yeah, we're good. She says, I don't know. I woke up this morning burdened for you and the girls, and June. I was anxious. I was disturbed and prayed for you, and then I decided to give you a call. I says, Mom, you're, you're, we're good. I don't know what's going on there, Mom, with mother's tuition and all of that, but we're good. She was happy, and so she kind of, uh, we put the phone down, we get in the car, and we headed towards Port of Don, about 15 miles from our home. Just as we were coming to the outskirts of the town, a huge explosion rocks our car, frightens the wits out of us and we see stuff flying through the air in the distance. It was a huge car bomb that the IRA had set in this Protestant town in Northern Ireland to wreak, you know, carnage and wreckage. We weren't going to port it down that day. But we later learned that the area we normally park in was, was badly damaged by the explosion. And I kind of worked it out in my head a couple of days after this. You know what? If my mom hadn't have called, we probably would have arrived in that car lot just as the bomb was going off. We were running late to Portadown, were we? Maybe not. Maybe God was making everything beautiful in its time. Was it a mother's intuition? Was it a nudge of providence? Maybe a combination of both. But I was reminded that day that there's a time to be born and there's a time to die, and that wasn't our day to die. God makes it all beautiful in his time. He's punctual. And the knowledge of his gracious purposes and his grand design provide us a font of encouragement. A couple of little thoughts here quickly. If you think about this, this is to take home. Then you need to give God time and you need to trust God in the meantime. Okay? Just give me a few minutes to get this across because you're going to live this this week. 
Okay, we're buying into the, the idea that God is sovereign. He appoints the times we go through, the things we face. Some of it we don't understand. We don't understand what God's up to from beginning to end. It's a kaleidoscopic movement of innumerable pieces that he puts together masterfully, sovereignly, unerringly, wisely. Therefore, I've got to give him time to make it all beautiful. Give him time. He'll make it all beautiful in its time. That's why Job says, when I am come forth, I will be as gold. That's why James says, let patience have its perfect work. God's work in us and for us takes time. But sometimes we act impetuously like the horse. Sometime later, look at Psalm 32, verse 9, where God says, I'm going to guide you with my eye. Be not like the horse, be not like the mule. The horse stampedes out of fear. The horse is an impetuous animal. Roaring to go has to be restrained by the rider. God says, don't you be like that. If I'm going to guide you, don't be like the horse running ahead of me. Don't be like the mule fighting me. The sovereign purposes of heaven in life are a kaleidoscopic movement of innumerable pieces, all dovetailing together into a masterful work of God that ripens perfectly and precisely at an appointed time to our greatest advantage. Amen? I like the old preacher story. The man who asked God how long a million years was to him. God says, a second. The man perks up. What about a million dollars? God says, a penny. The man gathers himself up and asks the Lord if he'd give him one of his pennies. God says, certainly, just a moment. <laughs> it's a fictitious story, but it makes a point. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Are you willing to trust God? Even at this moment, he may not explain what he's doing right now, but maybe the good of it will turn up in the next generation. Are you willing to trust him, give him time to make it all beautiful in its time? And then you've got to trust him in the meantime. It's hard in the hallway between a bitter past and a better future. That's why David says in Psalm 62, verse 8, that we must trust the Lord at all times. In the meantime, in the mystery, under the clouds of what God is up to beyond our human perception, are you willing to give God time? Are you willing to give him your trust? Are you willing to give him the benefit of the doubt that he's doing something right now in the middle of what you don't like, what you don't want? That's because of the immensity of his person. That's because of the incomprehensibility of his plan. That's why we're told in Ecclesiastes 3 verse 14 that God does all of this so that man might fear him. Perhaps right now you're feeling small, feeling confused, maybe even feeling victimized. <laughs> well, you've got to give God time and you've got to trust him in the meantime. That means fearing him. What does it mean to fear God? It's not to cringe in his presence. We don't need to do that because of the advocacy of the Lord Jesus. But it does mean we understand how awesome he is, how overwhelming his presence and power. We understand he's in control. And life may seem like an unfinished Rubik's Cube, but we'll fear him, we'll trust him, we'll ask questions, but we'll never question him. We'll embrace the idea that there's no panic in heaven, only plans. What is to fear God? It is to submit to his will. It is to be silent in his presence. It is to be steadfast in your faith, even in the face of life's harshest realities. It's to give God an unwavering, blind trust, despite what your eyes see and despite what your emotions feel. You'll say with Joe, when now I'm come forth, gold. <laughs> I'm going to endure. I'm going to let patience have its perfect work. I'm going to trust him at all times. Closing story. You'll like this. 1895. Seems like a long way back, but there's nothing new under the sun. This speaks to us today. Andrew Murray was in England suffering from a terrible back. 
He's a South African evangelist. He was doing some ministry in England. He's held up in a hotel room. He's confined to his bed. His breakfast is delivered by his hostess who tells him that there's a girl down in the dining room who knows that Andrew Murray's here, knows that he's an evangelist, a man of God, and she's going through a tough time and was wondering if he had any advice for her. He takes a piece of paper and he writes down this. Listen, in time of trouble say, first he brought me here. It is by his will I am in this straight place. In that will I rest. Next, he will keep me here in his love and give me grace in this trial to behave as his child. Then he will make the trial a blessing, teaching me lessons he intended to learn, working in me the grace he means to bestow. And last but not least, in his good time, he will bring me out again, how and when I do not know, but he knows. That's good, isn't it? In fact, he summarizes it for this lady. Therefore say, one, I am here by God's appointment. Two, in God's keeping. Three, under God's training. Four, according to God's time. Let's pray. Lord, may we hide your word in our heart that we may not sin against you in unbelief, in unholy thoughts about you, your plans and purposes. Lord, we would freeze frame our week and we would look back and we see things we don't like. We've experienced things we don't understand. At times, eternity has risen up in our hearts and we wonder where it's all going, where it's all headed and what our part in it all is. Thank you for reminding us there's a time and a season for everything. Thank you for reminding us you make it all beautiful in your time. Therefore, give us grace to give you time. Give us grace to trust you in the meantime. And Lord, as we hit the play button and we rush into a new week, we thank you we're comforted by these thoughts, that where we are is by God's appointment, kept in his keeping for this time. Lord, we thank you for these realities. We thank you that if our circumstances find us in God, we will find God in our circumstances. Amen. Amen. You're listening to Know the Truth and the third part of a message from Philip DeCourcy titled, It's About Time. If you miss any part of today's message or any of the previous parts, you can find them online by visiting ktt.org or by downloading the KTT app or podcast. Well, today's lesson was about the importance of trusting in God's divine timing and making the most of our circumstances. And to help you grow in this area, we're offering a book by Paul Mollard titled Investor Disappointments Going for Growth. This insightful book uses scripture, stories, and hymns to help you navigate life's challenges and view them as opportunities for spiritual growth and a deeper relationship with God. You can request your copy now by giving a gift of any amount in support of Know the Truth. Just call 888-644-8811 or visit ktt.org. And thank you for remembering that Know the Truth is a listener-supported ministry. That means it's your support that allows us to share the gospel with the world in need of truth, encouraging listeners through the radio, internet, printed resources, and even through special events. And Philip, you've got one of those special events coming up. Yes, October the 7th at Alta Vista Country and Golf Club in Placentia, California. I'll be hosting the first annual Know the Truth Golf Tournament and Dinner, and you're invited. I hope you'll join me and others to learn more about this event and register, visit ktt.org. All right, you'll see a banner at the very top of our homepage with all the information you need. Again, that's ktt.org. Well, that's our time for today. I'm Wayne Shepherd, inviting you to join us tomorrow when Pastor Philip begins the fourth part of a message titled, It's About Time. That's Friday on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.